All right, so I've mentioned before that right now we are just touching on integration. And for those of you moving on into Calc 2, integration gets lots deeper um, with lots more complexities as you go. So far, the only thing that you've had at your disposal to do for integration is algebra simplification and trig simplification. And that's it, right? Everything has to simplify in one of those two ways, and then you've got a series of, um, of basic simple rules that mirrored our basic simple rules for derivatives. Um, and that's it. There, there's nothing else. There's no product rule. There's no quotient rule. Nothing like that. There is one additional thing we're going to talk about, and that's this section. This is called integration by substitution. And this actually kind of harkens back to the chain rule. And that's where this is sort of coming from. So take a look at this particular function, y equals sine of x cubed minus 4x. I want you to remember what the derivative is for this thing. So what would the derivative be when we're dealing with this is a chain rule with sine. Cosine. cosine. Okay, so the derivative of sine is cosine. The chain rule says we rewrite the inside piece exactly like it is, so x cubed minus 4x. And then what do we have to do? Right, and what's the derivative of the inside, Adeline? Of x squared minus 4. Right. Okay, everybody good with that? I know we haven't really been doing a whole lot of derivatives lately, but are we okay with it now? Okay, cool. Um, all right, so what we're going to be doing in this section with integration by substitution is going in reverse. So consider that we actually started with this long thing that we just wrote out as our piece that we were trying to find an antiderivative of. Um, what you might notice if you started with that is that it looks like there's a product. And we already talked about the fact that we do not have a product rule, and you won't in Calc 2 either, by the way. There is no product rule for antiderivatives. There's just a bunch of different types of techniques that you can try, and this is the first of those techniques. So if we were to take that y prime, the difficulty that we would have in finding y is that it looks like there's a product. Does that make sense? So what do we have to do? Well, one option, the option we're going to consider in this section, um, is that if it looks like a product and we can identify that there's a composite function, something that looks like it came from a chain rule, then we're able to identify the inside function and the outside functions that are being multiplied. And if we're able to do that, then we can put together something called a substitution. So if we consider that y prime above, let me write it in here, since yours is on your paper but mine's not, uh, O is cosine. Okay, did I get it written in right? All right, okay. So if you consider that y prime above, this piece on the inside, whoops, this piece right here is an inside function. It's inside of a cosine, right? And beautifully enough, the piece that's outside of the cosine is its derivative, isn't it? Well, of course it is, we did that. Like we took the derivative and we made that happen, right? So what we can actually do is that piece that I highlighted, we can assign that as the letter u. So u is the inside function, x cubed minus 4x. And then if we do that, we can take the derivative of u. Now we're gonna use a notation that we didn't use too much, but it's helpful here. The derivative of u we've often called u prime. We're gonna call it du dx. We saw that before, just didn't use it much. What is the derivative? Well, it's the piece that's on the outside. It's the 3x squared minus 4 that we got, right? And if we were to multiply the dx to the other side of the function, this equation would change into du equals 3x squared minus 4 dx. Okay, just manipulated a little bit of algebra, but I need to show you why. So we're going to take the integral of the cosine of x cubed plus 4x, um, sorry, missed the piece, times 3x squared minus 4 dx. And we're going to do some things that you've seen before in other algebra contexts. We're going to take a piece and we're going to plug it in or we're going to substitute it in for its component. So in particular, if the u is equal to x cubed minus 4x, then this piece right here is now u. Does that make sense? Just reassigning values. 
The other one that we're identifying here is that the 3x squared minus 4 dx, which shows up right here, is what we're going to relabel as du. All good? What happens is it changes this into a function that I can easily take a derivative of, or at least I can use the rules that I have, right? So what's the antiderivative of cosine of u? Yeah, it's positive actually, but it's sine of u, okay? Positive sine of u. And then it's really got a plus c technically on the end, agreed? Because we're taking an antiderivative. But the question didn't start out having a u in it. I introduced the u into the problem, much like the derivatives and antiderivatives that we've been working with. I say things like, if it didn't start out with square roots, you don't end with square roots. If it didn't start out with radical power, rational powers, you don't end with rational powers, right? If it didn't start out with u, you're not going to end the, you know, the whole, I was about to say experiment, that's not right. You're not going to end the whole process with u, right? You're going to end it back with x. Well, that means you just have to replace u for what u represented. Well, u was x cubed plus 4x. Now, this isn't exactly what we started with. How does this compare to the very first part of our lesson today where I gave you the function? Somebody said it. How does it compare? It has a yes, thank you, Allie. It has a C, right? This that I started with right here is the same thing that I just got over here, but now I have a plus C. Uh, and we talked about the fact that C just moves things up and down. It's just a vertical shift. So you can't avoid that part of it. But what this does is it allows us to reverse the process that a chain rule would have created if I take derivatives. Now, not all products come from chain rules, right? That doesn't always happen. So this isn't something that works all the time. But when it works, it works very nicely. So in this section, what you're going to see in your homework is some combination of things. You're going to have some questions that are going to use this, this process, integration with substitution. You're going to have some questions that are going to push you into doing algebra or trig simplification. Okay. They're all going to be present, and there's going to be some that are going to need none of that. It's just going to be simple, finding the antiderivative the way you've seen in the other sections, but they're going to be all mixed together. So the burden is on you to decide when do I use this and when do I not. So we're going to do some examples that will hopefully help us to identify some of these things. Um, so in particular, when a use substitution is potentially present, you're going to see something that looks like a product almost always. Okay, There's going to be a couple caveats, and I think I have an example of one. But do you see something that looks like a product here today in this example? Sure. Uh, it looks like I've got a radical piece, and then I've got a piece that's not, and they're multiplied. This looks like a product. Now, the piece that looks like it's embedded inside of something, that's the radical piece, is the piece that you tend to look at first for your U substitution, U. This piece, like right here, seems like it's inside of another piece. So this is where we would start. We would look at this, and we'd say, hey, look. It looks like this piece, 3 minus 4x squared, is inside of the other one. So I'm going to start there. And then while I could write du dx like I did on the previous screen, I usually jump to the du part, and I'll show you what happens next. What is the derivative of 3 minus 4x squared? Negative 8x. And because I took the derivative with respect to x, I put the dx on the end. And if that bothers you, feel free to put the du dx and then move it afterwards. It doesn't matter. But that is the entire piece that I need to use for the substitution. So this piece goes into here. I shouldn't say it that way, sorry. This piece goes into here. This piece is being replaced for this piece. So what's over on the left-hand side, that is namely this, is going to go over here. I'm making a substitution. I have an integral. I now have the cube root of u, and then the piece at the end has become du. The cube root of u is not a particularly nice way to write that. It would be much more friendly to write it how? Right, u to the one-third. 
All right, so what is the antiderivative of u to the one third? Okay, so we've got u to the four thirds, and then we would divide by four thirds. And Adeline's already moving it for me to be multiplied by three fourths, which is lovely. So these are all variations of it. You don't have to show every piece of that, but that's how this is progressing. I need something else. I need a plus c. And I need to remember, that, well, there's two actually more things I need to do. Um, somebody tell me one of them. Put it back in the same terms. So can you give me some examples of what you mean, Alex? Good. So I have radicals. I need to put it back into radical form, right? So that's one of them. So I'm going to rewrite this, move up here. And it needs to be back in terms of x. You got it, Daniel. Okay, so I've got the 3 fourths. My, um, my radical form, since that's the one that was mentioned first, is the cube root of u to the fourth, like this. And then my u needs to be replaced by what u is actually equal to, which is 3 minus 4x squared. Make sure you still have the power of 4 on that, plus the c. Um, you might... Just remember, too, like the 4 doesn't matter if it's underneath the radical or outside the radical. They're equivalent versions, so that doesn't make any difference. Um, there are other ways that this could look. If you were looking at this um, and looking at somebody else's like solution, like a solution key kind of thing, you might also see it written like this. This is fine. The way it's written right now is what I would expect you to stop at, so I'm not asking you to do anything further. But if you're checking your solution with something else, I'd like for you to see what else it might look like. It might also look like this. Is my number three. And let me explain why this is the same. Um, the power of four right here, if you did four thirds, that would be one and one third. Here's the power of one. Here's the power of one third. That's where that's coming from. I don't think this particular version that I wrote second is better looking than the first one. In fact, it might be messier in some regards anyway. So I'm not asking you to do that, but I just want you to know that that's another option of how you might see it written. Is that okay? All right, let's take a look at another one. So this doesn't look like a product. Could we make it look like a product? I agree. Does that look okay? Does it look like a product now? Yes. Can you identify which piece seems to be embedded or inside of something else? What does it look like should be my inside or my u function? Yeah, the 1 plus x to the fourth. So that's the piece I'm going to identify. So u is 1 plus x to the fourth. And if so, what then is du? Not quite. Yeah. Still not quite. You need closer. 4x cubed dx. Okay, so I know what you're doing is you're trying to identify the pieces that remain in my original function that need to be identified as the derivative. And you're correct. Those pieces will be part of it. But when I'm taking the du, I really need to take the derivative of the u that I just created. So the u that I created has a power x to the fourth, like a piece that's x to the fourth power. So the four has to come down, x cubed, and then dx. And you might be looking at that and saying, yeah, but there's not a four in what you had before. And you're right, there's not. But we can get it there. It won't be a problem. Okay, is this piece okay so far? You see where the du came from. All right, so what do we do? Well, we want the right-hand side to say what you, many of you were saying at the beginning. We want it to say x cubed du, or x cubed dx, right? That's what we want it to say. So we simply make that happen by dividing by 4. So I'll rewrite it just to clean it up, but this is actually now a 1 fourth du equals the x cubed dx. 
So when I'm making my substitution, this piece that says x cubed dx gets replaced by a 1 fourth and a du, and you can separate them. It's kind of nice to have the coefficient at the beginning and the du at the end. So that's how I'm going to separate them. And in between there, I have u to the negative 2. So if you're only off by a constant, which we were here, the constant 4, that constant can be divided to the other side. Now, if you're off by a variable, we've got bigger issues, and it's probably a problem we have to address in a different way. But if you're off by a constant, we can deal with it, coefficient multiplier specifically. All right, so what's the antiderivative of 1 fourth u to the negative 2? I'll help you out. We start out with 1 fourth. Now what? Okay, so Adeline, you like to put it all together for me at once. Can you break okay. it down a little bit more? Okay. Um, so it would be u to the negative 2 power plus 1. Okay, so negative 2 plus 1 would be my negative 1, right? Yeah. Okay, one. and then? On the bottom would be negative 1. Good. Okay. I have my plus d at the end. Everybody good with that piece? Okay, if you could jump steps like Adeline's doing, that's great. Just by all means, that's fine. But here's what we have if we're taking it real slow taking the pieces just like they're showing up. Um, I need to move, or I, I, I'm able to move the negative one-fourth, the negative to the front of the one-fourth, and the u into the denominator. And then I have my plus c. I need one more thing to do. Put it in terms of x. Put it in terms of x. You got it. So I've got the negative one over four, and the u is one plus x to the fourth. Uh, there's no need to distribute the 4, although if you wish, you certainly could. It wouldn't hurt anything. Is it okay? So we can be off by constant multipliers and still do the process in much the same way. We can use this with trig as well, much like my original example started out today. It looks like a product, right? an algebra piece times a trig piece. What piece or what value looks like it's inside of something else? X to the fourth. So this piece right here is my best candidate for u. u is x to the fourth. So what would du be? 4x cubed dx. Now on this one, that's exactly the other pieces that are there. The last one didn't have the four part of it, but this one it does. So my substitution pieces are, are very clean here. Uh, the sine stays sine. The x to the fourth becomes u. And these two pieces on the outer edges right now are going to be the du. Now what is the antiderivative of sine of u? Negative cosine of u. And then plus c. But u is x to the fourth. So I do my replacement and I'm done. Okay, we're about to do a little bit more of an interesting one. At least it's different than the ones we've done. All the ones we've done so far are very similar in nature. This one's not. Uh, this one has a sine and a cosine, but the interiors are plain old x. They're not like powers of x like this, the ones we've seen on the other examples. Um, it's still helpful for us to rewrite it much like we did on this one over here where the denominator moves up to look like multiplication. Okay, So I want it to look like a product, and right now it doesn't. So we're going to change it to look like a product to start with. So this is sine of x. And then remember that when we have a 3 right here, it means that the cosine is being cubed. So I can change this to write cosine of x instead of positive power of 3. It'll be a negative power of 3. Is that rewrite step OK? It looks like a product. And at this point, you should be able to identify a function embedded inside of another one. Yes, ma'am. So why would you turn, turn like 
You could. There's other ways to do it. This one simply works really well to do this one with, but there are other things you could try. And then what's going to happen, in fact, Adeline, are you taking Calc 2? Yeah. Okay, what's going to happen in Calc 2 is you're going to explore a lot more of those kinds of things where you don't know from the get-go what our options are, okay. and you'll have those options showing up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can you see a U that's nice? Yeah, cosine x. So u is cosine x. What is the derivative of cosine of x? Negative sine. negative sine x. Careful on the negatives and positives, right? Sines and cosines, which direction you're going. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. I don't have a negative in my problem. But is it a big deal? No, it's not a big deal. In very much the same way that the 4 wasn't. I can, I can divide both sides by a negative 1 just fine. So this is negative du that will be my, be my replacement for my sine of x dx. So when I'm looking at these pieces, I will have a negative. You can put it in front even if you want, or you can put it inside. It doesn't matter. You will now have the um, cosine of x being replaced by a u. I have a power of negative 3, and the dx along with the sign at the beginning, are replaced by the negative and the du. Okay? Negatives just come along for the ride, just like a coefficient multiplier of 4 would have, right? So I've got negative as part of my answer. If you don't like that, write it as negative 1. That's fine, too. Uh, what do I do with the u to the negative 3? Oh, we add one to the power. Will that be okay? Good. So u to the negative 3 plus 1 would be negative 2. And I would divide by negative 2 and add my c. So I've got the power rule showing up. Uh, the negatives cancel out kind of nicely. So I have those canceling, so that's kind of friendly. Um, the u will go back into the denominator. So this is 2 u squared on bottom. And then what is u? Cosine. Cosine. So I actually have 1 over 2, and it's cosine squared of x plus my c. Um, there is another way you could see that written, and I think it's at least worth mentioning <coughs> because I don't want it to throw you. Cosine in a denominator like that has a reciprocal identity. The reciprocal of cosine is secant, so you could see this written as 1 half secant squared of x plus c. I'm okay with it left like this. I don't have a problem with that. But I don't want you to look at that and decide I didn't know what I was doing and therefore I did something wrong when you really didn't. This version is just fine, but it could be written like this as well. Okay, any questions on that one? Okay. So a couple of variations of these questions are coming up. Um, this one asks us to find an equation for a function that has the given derivative and whose graph passes through the given point. So if this is the derivative and we want to find the equation of the function, we have to find its antiderivative. So we're going to find the antiderivative of what's going on here. Now, the antiderivative of secant squared, do you remember what that is? Tangent, yes. So the only thing that's happening here that makes it an inside function, and you might even look at this and say, I don't see a product rule. Uh, and there's really not one, right? It's just secant squared and there's a 2x. Where's the product? Well, because there's a 2x on the inside, we can treat this, we'll come back to this piece in a minute. We can treat this as a u substitution where u is the 2x, because what's the derivative of 2x? Not x, but 2. two. two. Yeah, so 2, no worries. 2 dx. Uh, 2 is just a constant, right? Like the 4 and like the negative. So even though it doesn't look like there's a product rule, and there's really not, because it's just the inside's a constant or has a derivative that's a constant, we can use the u substitution in much the same way. So we can still divide by 2 like we divided by our 4. This is 1 half du is going to equal... Sorry, dx. So as we're doing the replacement here, I still have secant squared 
and now it's secant squared of u. And the dx um, that I, sorry, I didn't write it in, I apologize. I put in the script, or the integration symbol, the dx should have gone at the end. The dx at the end gets replaced by du, and the one half, I'll put it at the beginning. You can put it inside if you wish. So we already made mention of the fact, oh, on the left-hand side, this becomes just f of x, because that's my function's name since the derivative was given. Secant squared's antiderivative, you told me, was tangent, and you were right. But what is u? 2x. Now, if we were not given anything else, we could stop here, but the part that I circled actually tells us we can solve for c, okay? So how do we do that? Well, this, the circled part gives me a value for x and a value for y. So y, which is f of x, is 2, and x is pi over 2. So this is actually 1 half tangent of 2, and then I'm multiplying it by pi over 2. And when I do that, the only thing I don't know is C, and I will be able to find it. So you might want to take the 1 half and multiply it to the 2 just to shift it over. This will be a 4 equals. Uh, this is the tangent of pi plus C, if you want to do a few steps. Do you know what the tangent of pi is? Is it zero? So think unit circle. Let me walk through how to think about it, a reminder. Pi is over here. Tangent of an angle is y over x. What's the y value when I'm right here? Zero. It's zero. And the x value is one. So this is actually a zero value. So this piece is four equals zero plus c. C is four. So the function that I'm looking for is 1 half tangent of 2x plus 4. Okay, I'm going to do one more example, and I'm going to push pause. Actually, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to push pause. I'm going to let you all leave, and I'll record the last two examples like I've done before so that you have them to refer back to later. Okay, go ahead and watch those last two pieces so we can continue with what we have expected. This one is very interesting, and when it shows up, it's easy to let it throw you. It definitely looks like a product, correct? Really does. Um, the problem is that if you take a look at what seems to be the inside function, what looks like it's inside? The 2 minus x should look like it's inside because it's inside of a radical. So if I made the identification that the inside function is 2 minus x, and I took the derivative, I would get negative 1 dx, and that is definitely not x plus 1. Agreed? So it feels like that your integration by substitution fails you. It actually has a very nice caveat, and it doesn't fail, so let me show you how. We're going to take this equation that we created for u, and I want to solve it for x. So I'm going to shift the 2 to the other side. u minus 2 equals negative x. And then I'm going to change my signs, right? divide by negative. So this is actually going to be negative u plus 2 is equal to x. Just bear with me, and you'll see where we're going. Is the algebra OK so far? So I am going to replace this piece with u. So this is u to the 1 half. I am going to replace my dx with a du, uh, well, a negative du, right, because I'm going to shift the negative over, divide by a negative. So the negative will go at the beginning. And what happens in front of the x, where I have x plus 1, is the x gets replaced with the u value. Well, x is supposed to be negative u plus 2. So this is negative u plus 2 and then plus the 1. Um, I'm going to distribute the negative through here in a minute. So uh, right now I have negative u plus 3, and I have u to the 1 half du. And you might be saying, well, it still looks like a product. What good did that do me? Here's what good it did. 
What's underneath the radical previously had addition and subtraction in it, right? What's underneath the radical or inside of the power of 1 half no longer does. It's a single term. Let me distribute my negative, and then I'll show you what we are allowed to see happen because we did this. So there's distributing my negative, u to the 1 half, du. Because I no longer have addition and subtraction underneath the radical, I can distribute this just like I did in algebra. So this piece right here, u to the 1 half, can be distributed to each one of these pieces. I can't do that if there's addition and subtraction underneath the radical. So if I have u times u to the 1 half, properties of exponents tell me that's u to the 3 halves. And then I have minus 3 u to the 1 half. And while they might not be beautiful values, they're integrable values. I can work with them because the addition and subtraction is no longer happening under an, a square root. It's happening with between square roots. u to the 3 halves is going to add 1 of power. It's going to be a 5 halves. u to the 1 half will become u to the 3 halves. I'm just adding 1 to the exponents plus my c. I need to substitute values back in, but I've done the calculus at this point, right? Like the real calculus part, the integration part, has been accomplished. I was successful in doing so. So I need to clean up the algebra. I need to rewrite the 5 halves as division as 2 fifths. I need to write the fact that I have u to the 5 halves as the square root of u to the fifth. I'll put my u's in in a minute. Same thing on this one. I have 2 thirds times 3. That actually ends up giving me a 2. Uh, and I have the square root of u cubed plus my c. And if I replace my u in here, I will have, um, what did I have? 2 fifths. And then the u is 2 minus x. 2 minus x to the power of 5. And then I have plus minus minus 2 square root of 2 minus x cubed and then plus c. I'm OK with you stopping right there. And I'm going to pause the video right there. When I pick back up in the video, I'm going to show you there is a little bit of algebra simplification you can do to this to make it look prettier. Uh, and if you were comparing it to something else, I'd want you to make sure you know where it came from, okay? So I'm going to push pause. We're at about 33 minutes in. So I'm going to pick up with the algebra simplification, kind of like I did on a couple problems ago. I think it was example, let's see, example number mm, where was it? Uh, example number one, actually, um, where I showed you that there's another variation that you could see written in a slightly different way. So on this one, because I have a power of 5 underneath the radical, I could pull two of those out, right? Like a 5 halves power is 2 and a half. So I could rewrite this as having 2 minus x squared out here. And then the square root of 2 minus x is the half power. And the same thing on the, the other piece, a power of 3 and a half is the same thing as a 1 and a half power. So here's the power 1, and then here's the power that's the 1 half piece. So there's a couple reasons why this might be preferable. Um, you're actually able to combine some pieces because notice these radicals actually match. So I could factor that radical piece out. Um, I can also do some algebra simplification with the other pieces. So for instance here, I've got a 2 fifths. I can simplify the 2 minus x squared. That's 4 minus 4x plus x squared. And then on the other, I've still got a square root of 2 minus x. On the other one, um, I can actually write this as negative 4. Um, and then, actually, you know what? Let me do this. Let me pull that square root of 2 minus x to the back. I think that might be easiest in the same step. So this is square root of 2 minus x. It's going to be multiplied. Well, I don't need that there, here by the piece that comes before. So what comes next here is the minus 4 and then um, minus, uh, plus 2x. And still have that plus c on the end, of course. Um, I can simplify the pieces that are inside the parentheses. Um, so here's 2 fifths. I have here, um, what I really have is I have 4 minus 4, so those add to 0. Um, this is negative 4x, and it ends up being um, 
plus 2. So negative 4x plus 2 would be a 2x. Okay, let me pause. Sorry, I forgot that the first one was multiplied by um, the 2 fifths. I apologize. Let me do that part first. Uh, it won't cancel out the negative 4. I apologize. Uh, we need to distribute this piece first through. Pay attention to my notes just a little bit better. Sorry, guys. Uh, so let's try that again. Okay, so the 2 fifths times the 4 would be 8 fifths. The 2 fifths times the 4x would be negative 8 fifths x, and the 2 fifths times the x squared would be positive 2 fifths x squared. And we're going to combine that with the negative 4, the positive 2x. I nicely enough have this 2x, 2 minus x underneath the radical still and the plus c at the end. None of that changes. I'm going to shift this up and give myself just a little bit more room. There we go. Um, combining like pieces, this actually ends me up with a negative 12 fifths, a positive 2 fifths x, and a positive 2 fifths x squared. So if I combine like terms in the first piece and the second piece, this is what I have. My square root of 2 minus x plus c. Um, once again, this is a perfectly reasonable place to stop. You might notice that each of those um, coefficients at the beginning of the um, polynomial piece have a 2 on the top that they will divide by and a 5 on the bottom. So you could also pull the 2 fifths back out if you wished. And you could write it as x squared. I'll shift it around so my x squared is first, plus my x, and then minus a 6. So again, I, I don't need you to do this in any stretch of the imagination, but I just want you to be aware that if you're looking at another version of a solution, this might show up. All right, let's take a look at a couple more examples. Um, the last two examples tell us what happens when we have definite integrals. And there's a couple ways to do definite integrals. So if you've seen this before and you like a way you're doing it differently better, by all means, you may continue to do it in that way. Um, but this way, actually, I feel like minimizes mistakes. And so that's the way I'm going to approach it. Um, so I'm going to rewrite my integral from 1 to 9. And I'm going to leave the square root of x on the denominator like this. But the other piece that's raised to the power 2, I'm going to bring up. So this is 1 plus the square root of x. Instead of power of 2 in the denominator, I have a power of negative 2. My u substitution value will be the part that's inside the parentheses, which is 1 plus the square root of x. Um, if it's helpful, you can rewrite that as 1 plus x to the 1 half, of course. Uh, the derivative of the 1 is 0. The derivative of the other piece is 1 half x to the negative 1 half dx. But again, I would tend to probably want to rewrite it because we're going to try and identify how it looks on the other side, right? So I would have that as 1 over 2, and it's now the square root of x dx. Now, if you compare this to what we have over here, I have the 1 over square root of x. I don't have the 2 part, right, the 1 half part. So as I'm taking a look at this, this 2, I'm going to multiply to the other side. So this is going to change into 2 du equals 1 over square root of x dx. So as I'm looking at this next step where I do substitution, I am going to leave the 1 and the 9, the limits of integration, off. And the reason I am is because those limits of integration apply to the variable x, and I'm turning my x's into u's. Now, we're going to get back to them. We'll bring them back in. We're not going to ignore them completely, but we can ignore them momentarily. So these two pieces get replaced with a 2. I'll put the 2 in the front and a du at the back. The part in the middle is now u to the negative 2. So the antiderivative of u to the negative 2 is u to the negative 1 over negative 1. I don't need to do plus c. I was about to do it, actually, uh, because I'm going to do limits of integration with the 9 and the, and the 1 eventually anyway. So the only thing to rewrite here is this is negative 2 on top, and it's u on bottom. But I know what u is, right? u, if you remember, is equal to 1 plus the square root of x. So I will replace my u with 1 plus the square root of x. And once I have it in that form, I can go back to the 1 and the 9. So there's my 9 on top and my 1 on bottom. And I can use those limits of integration. So I have a negative 2 on top. I have a 9 to put on the bottom, so this is 1 plus the square root of 9. And then minus, and I have negative 2 on top, and 1 plus the square root of 1 on bottom. Square root of 9 is 3, so this ends up giving me negative 2 over 1 plus 3, which is 4. 
minus a negative here, these are going to change to positive, so I have plus and I have a 2, and I have a 1 over 1, which is, I'm sorry, a 1 plus square root of 1, which is a 2 on bottom. So this is negative 1 half plus 1, and I get a grand total of 1 half. All right, last example, I've got some sines and cosines. I want to bring this to your attention because part of this is going to use a very simple u substitution. The other part doesn't need it at all. So if you take a look at this first piece right here, I can do the antiderivative of sine x before I ever got into this section of material. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to separate these out into two separate integrations. The first piece doesn't need u substitution. The second piece is going to have a substitution, a nice simple one, but none, I mean, it's going to have one nonetheless. So the first piece you're welcome to just do. The antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. Um, we're evaluating that at pi and at zero. I'm just going to finish this piece completely. So negative cosine of pi minus a negative cosine of zero. So minus a negative is positive. Uh, cosine of pi is actually negative one. So this is the opposite of negative one. And then plus the cosine of zero, cosine of zero is one. So this is one plus one. We have two from the first half of this thing. Now we're gonna go back and fill in the other piece. Uh, the other piece needs a u substitution. Uh, again, it's a simple one. And we've seen one like this before. We saw it with a, a secant squared function, I believe. Um, u is equal to the two x. And then the du would equal two dx. I don't have a 2, so I'll divide by 2. So my dx is actually just 1 half du. So I'm going to leave the limits of integration off because I'm changing it into u. The 1 half shows up, the du shows up, and I have the cosine of u. Okay, so the 1 half comes along for the ride. The antiderivative of cosine of u is sine of u. I don't need a plus C because I'm going to be putting the values in eventually here in a moment anyway. Um, my U value is 2X. Once my X's are back, I can put in the pi and the zero. All right, so the sine of pi, which now would be 2 pi, minus, um, actually let's do it this way, the 1 half, the sine of zero. And this one's interesting, right, because the sine of 2 pi is 0, the sine of pi is 0, so actually there's nothing that's achieved in this back piece. This is 0 minus 0. I got a bunch of zeros. So the answer to this problem is actually the 2 that came from the first piece.